I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, um, Phil de Glanville. Thank you. So Phil's career has been a mix of life at the top end of the professional sport, combined with his wide experience across commercial, public and educational sectors. He has worked as a development and relationship manager for the Sport Indians and was appointed director for elite sport at Hartbury College. He's currently returned to his commercial sector as he works for um, Hanover Fox uh, in executive search, which for some of you might not know that, it's really headhunting. Most of you will probably know Phil as an outstanding sportsman. Phil has 38 caps. He captained England in the 1996 to 1997, 1997 season. Phil joined the RFU, which is the Rugby Football, Football Union Council in 2007, representing universities. In 2008, Phil was selected as the senior RFU representative on the Professional Game Board, which is the partnership body set up to oversee the professional game in England. Phil is an alumni of Durham. He has a son at Durham and he has been a mentor on the academy for the last three years. He has been a great, actually a phenomenal support for Durham University and we are most grateful to have him speaking to us tonight and I thank him for all his support for the program to date. So without further ado, thank you Phil for speaking to us tonight on COVID-19 and the effects on the RFU. If there ever was a kind of time um, for leadership, this is it. Um, uh, not just clearly from our own government, um, but, but every government uh, acro across the world. So uh, this is a, a very, very challenging uh, pandemic for, for, for the whole world, as you all know. Um, so, you know, the usual mantra about managing change uh, and coping with change and, and trying to be on top of it as it were is is really um <laughs> accelerated in the current environment you have to be nimble on your feet you have to understand what's happening uh, quickly and then be in a position to adapt and be ahead of it as far as you possibly can um, and, and so that's what we're trying to do we're, we're having weekly board calls now um, we're reviewing the situation the whole time. Um, the chief medical officers of, of, of all of the professional sports are, are meeting the Department of Culture and Media and Sport tomorrow to get government advice, the latest government advice. So it's a constant changing, uh, changing feast. You've got to stay on top of it. I'm going to start with a little bit of a, a, back, a back story about, uh, about the finances of the RFU just so you can put it in context, what's happening with COVID now over the last kind of eight to 10 years, um, because it you know, had, has been until, until last year and, and, and now this year, a, a pretty good story in terms of growth. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of a background to that, um, just so you can understand it. And I really want to emphasize the importance of broadcasting, uh, TV broadcasting in, in funding the whole game. And that's not just from World Rugby and the Rugby World Cup's point of view, the Six Nations, the Autumn Internationals, the Premiership, uh, the European competition. At every level, broadcasting, TV broadcasting and media broadcasting generally is absolutely fundamental in, in funding the whole game. And I'll show you some, some, some breakdown of that. We'll get a little bit into um, a, a, a comment about the current structure of the game um, and, and World Rugby's role in that, um, which is the international governing body, and how we're trying to make things better in terms of who plays who when. Um, so we'll explain a little bit of that and then, and then kind of roll that up at the end in, in terms of the challenges if you are a potential professional player coming through an academy as, a, as an 18 year old, you know, potentially thinking about combining university with professional rugby, um, either or, 
ideally um, that then some of the challenges that that, uh, that that group of young men and women now that it's professional um, for, for England women um, will, will be facing. Okay, so that's well, about four or five slides on, on income and expenditure and, and the broadcasting uh, and the last couple on, 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 on world rugby and the challenges going forward. I was back to the basic point of trying to explain uh, that how, how, how well revenue has grown over the last 10 years. And actually we've got a little bit further back here. So here you've got 2004 to 2008. And that's the kind of total uh, rugby investment at, at that at that stage. It's slightly different here in that this also includes capital investment, which we have borrowed um, from the bank to to invest into the stadium at, at Twickenham. But you can see the general trend over that 15 years has been obviously very significantly up in terms of investment into the game. And there's a split here between professional rugby um, and community rugby. Both aspects have, have grown significantly. Part of the reason here uh, that this bit was, is so big uh, in, in that third cycle was because we, we did a, a, a new deal with the Premiership around um, how, how we reward them for developing England qualified players. So that, uh, that, that kind of incentive scheme um, jumped there. But I guess the, print, the, the point I'm trying to make is you, you've had this very significant period of investment through to last year where it, it stabilised. Um, and when the next slide, you're going to understand why COVID is going to have potentially such a, such a huge impact on the sport. Okay, so you're going to... David, I've lost control of the slides again. Um, yep, just one second. You can just shift one on, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There we go. Okay, am I back in control? Yeah, I think I am. All um, right. Yep, so this, should be. This is where um, this is this is where the RFU um, and therefore a big part of the whole game in in england makes its money and there are four key income streams and you go back to what i said earlier about the importance of tv and broadcasting nearly a third of our income comes from the broadcasting deals that we do uh, for the internationals that uh, that that england players play Okay, so the autumn series that some of you uh, might be aware of, and then the Six Nations that I'm sure everyone is aware of, uh, nearly a third of the income for those internationals comes from TV. Sponsorship, which is built off the back of that as well, and, and sponsors getting involved because they, they want us to have their brand um, profile and, and alignment with with the England teams at every level is nearly 20% so nearly a fifth of that and our our international match receipts here uh, are, is is 28% so that's the gate receipts that we get um, and then TAL is Twickenham Experience Limited which is all of the commercial the hospitality that we run and the corporate boxes um, and then other is other games that uh, like the Premiership final, for instance, that we host at Twickenham. So the point, key point out of this is almost all of our revenues, 85%, are generated by England playing an England men's team, not the England women's team yet. But hopefully there'll be potential for that in the future. Um, playing their home matches at Twickenham. Okay, so if we can't play home matches at Twickenham, that 85% of the total revenue of the RFU is at threat. Okay, so I just want you to understand how important that is. The same applies for every professional sport. Um, and, and, you know, cricket obviously had a new league potentially starting this summer. Uh, the 100, as they call it, um, you know, that, that, is, that is at threat. Um, you know, that, that, that is a big, they, they've 
got sponsorship agreements for that. They would have had big gates for it. They've got TV broadcasting deals for it um, through the BBC. That If that does not go ahead, which is looking increasingly likely for cricket, it's going to be very, very damaging for the sport. So this scenario is being faced in every single professional sport. Less so in football, where actually it could be argued that the premiership generates more uh, in revenue and income and, and does generate more revenue and income than the England internationals. Slightly different model for them. But for rugby and for cricket, where the national team still has primacy, um, yeah, this, is a, this is a big issue for us. Okay, so that's where we make uh, our money. You've got, everyone got a clear understanding of how important those England home games are. And this is where we spend it. Okay, and I've just done it on percentages for you. So, you know, just under 30% is spent on actually those men's 15 aside games. So we, we've got a, an agreement, a contract called the Professional Game Agreement with the Premiership, which basically rewards them and incentivizes those Premiership clubs to have a higher percentage of England players in their teams. And so England coaches can pick from a bigger pool of, of England players. Um, obviously, we pay the players to, to play the game. Um, and there's a significant cost that comes with that. And you have all the infrastructure around the England coaching uh, staff and team to, to run that. Um, and it's a, probably about 25 to 30 million pounds a year that goes from the RFU to the Premiership, okay, which is one of, uh, one of the biggest sources of income for them. And it, it's back to what I said earlier about this rugby ecosystem we are all interlinked, we are all interdependent. So if one part of the system fails or is under stress, every other part of the system is, is going to be under stress too. But that's, that's, that's one, one aspect of it. The second is obviously actually managing the stadium itself, Twickenham Stadium. Um, so the operational expenditure that goes into that, but also, you know, it's an accounting Factor depreciation, any asset you own, you have to effectively uh, allocate money against it each year so that, uh, that it kind of is correctly managed in, in, in the finances. We have what we call the cost of sales. So all of the stewards, the transport, the security we put on at matches, the people who sell the hospitality, the ticket office, sell the tickets, etc. all of those costs uh, of, of, of actually running the stadium and the events um, that go into them. And then, then overheads for the union. And these, these are you know, all of the, 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 the rugby development officers that go out into the community and support community clubs, um, the, the, the senior management team, the finance team, the HR team, the things that every organization has to to run them as an organization and and back to what we do as a national governing body the discipline team those who enforce and change the rules and regulations um everything that goes with with, with running a national governing body so actually we've got relatively little if you think of all of those as as they're not fixed because there is some flexibility in them but most of them are, 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 are very hard to change quickly. What we call the rest of our rugby investment um, is where we have more flexibility. So we can you know, turn on and off programs um, and reduce investment into certain parts of, of what we do. And you can see there on, on, on the top, the pathway, sevens, all the sports science, how we develop refereeing, coaches, all of the community rugby investment is in here too. There's more flexibility um, around some of that. But when you start looking at depreciation here, you know, overheads, people, you know, if your revenue is dropping significantly, you're pretty quickly going to start to get into some of these. Okay. So, and that is the conversation, you know, that, that we're, we are having to explore at the moment with COVID. And, and the issue with COVID is that, you know, nobody knows 
how long it, it's going to last in, in, in sense of its impact on, on sporting events. Um, you know, when the, when the government announces um, whatever the plan is as we come out of lockdown, um, I suspect that large mass gatherings, which is what a sporting event is, will be pretty close to last on the list of, of, of being relaxed. Um, and that will depend on whether there's a second wave, whether, wh whether we can develop a, um, uh, an anti, um, anti uh, whether we can develop a, um, a, an injection for it, that's um, a vaccine for it, um, all of these different factors that, that kind of go into that. So this is just, for, for England games, the issue we, we've also got is for the Premiership and, and for the Championship playing Premiership games. Um, and I'll come on to that kind of in, in, in a minute in terms of, of the structure of the season and, and the impact of those. So this is the way the current, what's called global season is, is laid out. Um, at the top, you can see the internationals. Here we have uh, Europe and the club season and, and at the bottom here Sanzar is, is the southern hemisphere. Um, so South Africa, New Zealand, Argentina and Australia who, who make up Sanzar. Um, they play their internationals here which is the rugby championship the Northern Hemisphere plays its autumn series here, and then we play the Six Nations here. Um, and the summer tour, which was due to go to Japan for, from England's perspective, uh, if that tour is cancelled, Japan was expecting to gain about 15 million pounds from that tour in terms of revenues for them. That would be a straight loss for, for Japan. Um, and the You've got all of the club competitions here and you'll see we have this challenge that the Gallagher Premiership, all of the Premiership competitions runs through the Autumn Series and through the Six Nations Series. So you have England players who are being taken out of the Premiership to prepare for and to play in those series. And, and we incentivize and, and reward the Premiership for for the ability to take those players um and and that is what's in that professional game agreement b between us and and the sands are clubs down here they have what's called super rugby in the southern hemisphere which runs during this period so you can see that at the moment there's a huge amount of overlap between those um there isn't a clear uh structure between north and southern hemisphere and within England we've got this and and the UK so Wales and Scotland too we, we've got this issue of the Six Nations in the autumn series uh, overlapping with the Gallagher Premiership um, and and the other competitions in 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 Wales and, and Scotland so there is an opportunity potentially um, you know probably driven by the financial challenges of, of COVID to, to sort this out um, and to remove the duplication that, that is here between international matches and between club matches uh, to everyone's benefit. Um, that, that, that is, there's, a, there's conversations going on on a daily basis between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere um, national governing bodies um, so they are trying to get all the different pieces of the jigsaw into one place and that is quite a challenge when you look at um, um, the different positions the unions are in so Australia for instance do not own a Twickenham they have to pay for for rent basically to rent the stadiums that they use so even the international matches that they run do not make them as much money as Twickenham does for us with its scale and the fact that we own it and every penny we spend on it and every, spe every penny that goes into it revenue wise comes back to the RFU and therefore out to the game. 
so they they have got a big challenge and, and you know trying to make sure that all those southern hemisphere unions um are, stay strong is, is 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 part of our responsibility as as the rfu there's just no point if australia were to go bankrupt we would have no australia to play um it's in everyone's interests to uh, to do that so it is um it, it is a very, and, and you'll see um, that the rugby championship, which is scheduled here for August and September, you know, that is under huge threat. Um, so if those Southern Hemisphere teams, those Sanzar teams can't play each other during that August and September period, they will lose all of their income from, 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 from playing those matches. Um, and, and you can imagine they're already stretched anyway. That's that's going to be a big big challenge for for them. So all of this is kind of cast in in the uncertainty of, as I said, of not knowing when we might be able to get back to playing. Um, I think the reality is that social distancing means that, that there is a stage one where we may end up playing games without any fans there. Um, both Premiership games and internationals. Um, so, from a broadcasting perspective, then you know that's that's good. But if you go back to my slide here, you look at thirty percent comes from international match receipts. That would be gone straight away. Um, so it's still going to mean a significant reduction in in, in income, um, even if we end up. Uh, playing behind closed doors, as it were. So the stresses on the whole sport globally um, of this are, are, are huge. Um, and you know, you look at other sectors and anyone whose product, which is what rugby is, rugby is our product, a match at Twickenham or a match at, at, uh, at, at Bath, at the rec, are are our products um, and if we are now being obviously got no opportunity to put that product in front of people then your revenue effectively just just stops overnight um, and that's the position you know we're, we're facing at the moment the premiership clubs are, are facing that as individual clubs um, the rfu is facing it and and everything therefore that the rfu supports and and funds is facing it in a in a strange way probably the strongest um part of the system will, will be the community clubs who, who generate a lot of revenue themselves um through through their own their own fundraising um and therefore are less dependent on on funding from the rfu um and and they i'm sure will be able to find better ways around it um, uh, but obviously a lot of them have taken advantage of of the rates um um, relief from from the government uh, and, and and kind of some pressure on their costs at the moment which which is uh, very thankful as far as they're concerned just come on to the players now um, you know last last two slides and this is the current kind of structure and what we call pathway uh, for for players so here on, on the right is the pathway, um, and, and here on the left, if you like, are the, are the competitions that, that people play in. Um, so you start, obviously, as a, uh, in, in your community club or, or in your school as a mini and a youth playing rugby in the school. For girls, we have under 15 and under 18 um, uh, county groups what's called the developing player program for boys under 14 to 16, which again is based around the premiership academies working with their counties in their area. And then you progress from that into um, player development group under 17 and 18. Some, some of those players are, are, are earmarked for England Academy at, at that stage too. And then you go into the formal England under 18 team the england 20 team and and then through into the full england team and the competitions you play at you know during that journey as it were are kind of here here on the left and um, so starting in, in 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 community clubs you might obviously go to university or college as part of that 
Um, there are other kind of semi-professional clubs at, at level three and five. The championship is 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 at the moment still a, a fully professional uh, league with some semi-professional teams in it. And then you're into the premiership and the top here is the elite player squad. That's the players, the 45 players in the England squad um, that are drawn from this premiership pool. So that, that's the pathway at the moment. And again, through the opportunities, you know, as a young professional player, um, working your way through this system, um, you typically become contracted as you leave school uh, at 18. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is a, it's an opportunity for us to just to refine this pathway uh, and, and the competitions that those young men and women play in. Um, to, to make them more, more efficient, more optimal than they are at the moment. So the challenges for young professional players are really based, just, it's just this uncertainty. Um, it's the uncertainty about when the lockdown will end, the uncertainty about when they will be able to, to play again. Um, if you're an existing professional player, they're all at home, um, a lot of whom have been furloughed at, at the moment. Uh, the complexities of actually coming back into a training environment are, 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 are very, well, they are, they're very complex. Um, if one of, the, one of your squad you know, shows, shows symptoms, what testing can we put in place to, uh, to, to effectively uh, diagnose that person quickly and take them out of the the club environment, what's the impact on the rest of the players and support staff who've been around them. Trying to get ourselves back to playing is, 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 is a very complicated and, and complex thing. It's, it's not just a sense of, right, tomorrow you can all start training um, and, and in a few weeks time you can all start playing matches again. Um, it is a physical game you need to recondition for a certain period to get back into uh, before you play um, and all of these uncertainties that we've got around knowing whether we'll, you know, whether teams or individuals are going to get covid and therefore be put in isolation for for a period they're, they're, it's such an uncertain environment i've, I've never never known it uh, to be this uncertain so the, the headlines for that are, you know, it's having, having seen the increasing revenues, you know, for, for a decade that, that I showed you, um, it's going to go the other way. Um, and, and how much it goes the other way really just depends on how long it lasts, when matches can come back, when our product can be back safely, players and fans are, are safely back on, on the pitch and in the stand. Um, and, and we don't know when that's going to be. So some clubs, professional clubs, may not survive that. Um, you know, the cash flow is going to be very tight during during this period. There's some may go bust, um, and and generally the, the sport may the professional uh, aspect of the sport may want to reduce salaries, um, smaller squad sizes potentially, so there's less employment opportunities. Um, for those for those men and, and women coming through into into professional rugby, um, on on the plus side, as I tried to demonstrate with the, the global calendar, potentially we could get the first time that international and club matches are, are deconflicted, so they they work to support each other rather than being on on at the same time. There is a chance of the game becoming more sustainable through some of the cost reductions. That, that, that are, are, are inevitably going to come through because you know, currently uh, the owners of the Premiership are, are still putting their hands in, in their pockets to the tune of about 30, 35 million pounds. So it's not sustainable at the moment. And there is the opportunity through this genuine dialogue um, between Northern and Southern Hemisphere of having a, a world international competition um, that, that's Obviously, it's not the Rugby World Cup, but um, uh, some form of, of meaningful competition that sits underneath that on, on, a, on an annual basis or maybe even a biannual basis beneath that. So I think if you're a, um, if you're a professional 
you know, player at, at, at the moment. And I have to declare an interest in the centre my son is um, at Bath. You know, it, it is a it is a very difficult time. Um, and and you, you, you will see some of these things play out in, in rugby in, in the next six months. Um, you, you will almost certainly see them play out in, in other sports too. Um, so I think, I, I, I think you know, trying to understand um, the, the importance of those international matches um, on, on the whole game and, and the reality if they do not get played I think is a, is a really kind of key message I just want to, to, to get across to you. Um, and you add to that the uncertainty that we all face in, in all of our lives. I suspect you're will concern those of you who are trying to go into jobs um, or, or find jobs. Uh, th those of you that are potentially coming back next year, um, you know, how, will, how will the degree run for you? You know, it is uncertainty for everyone. Um, and, I, and I guess I'll come back to my point I said at, at the start, you know, if ever there was a time for, for leadership, you know, this is it. Um, and, and leadership in, a, in an environment of, of constant change, literally daily change, um, which, is, which is what we're facing um, at the moment. Uh, thanks, Phil, for your presentation. Um, really, really interesting and of great value. I'm sure we're going to enter questions now. Um, before we start those questions, I was going to just ask you a question unrelated to that, just to start off while we get all the chat going and all the questions going. And that's around, you know, you're obviously very busy in, in your professional career and um, your dealings with the RFU, but yet you find time to be a mentor for us on this academy. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say just why and any, um, any benefits you have from it? If you do, yeah, I, I I really I really enjoy it, Chantal. To be honest, um, and 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 the benefits are, are, you know, I've had two two mentors, or you know, this is my second year of mentoring, um, and it, it, I guess the, the the benefits are just seeing you know that person develop over that period. Um, you know, we were we were all in the same position um, at university, kind of coming out. Some people are lucky to know exactly what they want um, and what they what they're aiming for, um, and and what their kind of strengths are and, and and what they need to work on. But but others, I'd say the vast majority, the vast don't. majority don't. So having having the opportunity to help people with that is is really rewarding. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I I really enjoy it. So yeah, you can you can count me in for next year, Chantal. <laughs> Um, yeah, and this year you meant that somebody was unrelated to sport, and that that must have been quite interesting too. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, you, you know, obviously a very a very different because in you know, my first year um, it was someone who was in, involved in sport, um, and this year it isn't. Um, and, and I've yeah, I found it I found it fascinating. Um, a, a, I'm also learning about um, you know other aspects of you know what she does. Um, which is not an area I, I'm strong in, um, so so that's been that's been, that's been great fun. Um, you mentioned um, in one of the like the positives was that we can or that you can do things like um, uh, making the rugby internationally more sustainable, changing the timing so that international and national competitions don't clash. All these very things. Um, how much effort is currently going into those like long-term visions and, and making those those big reforms um, now? Like, how how much are people taking advantage of this like short window in like chaos for establishing new <laughs> systems that are like a lot better for the long-term future? And you know, the second things like start going again, it's obviously very difficult to actually change things again. Yeah, no, you're dead. You're dead right. It is um, though. It is a, It is a window of opportunity we've got. Um, and, and you're right, it's, it is chaos. Um, and, and so what's happened is, is the, all of the CEOs of, 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 the, of, the, of the main unions um, are all talking uh, pretty much every kind of second or third day um, and, uh, uh, about, you know, there's got to be a bit of give and take, you know, from, from Northern and Southern Hemisphere. Um, and and you know, 
you know, what works perfectly for the southern hemisphere might not for the northern and and, and vice versa but i i think um i think we've got a very good chance of of, of sorting that out and, and the, the difference we have in the northern hemisphere is that france and and england um obviously have a very strong premiership um which is you know a, a separate entity those clubs are, are a separate entity whereas you know, Wales has the regions that are kind of you know integrated as part of, of the WRU and Scotland has its regions that are integrated as part of the, of the Scottish rugby union it's a different model in France and England so we do have to work um, alongside the premiership and uh, as partners and 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 likewise the French do so I, I think just understanding that actually the rugby ecosystem is slightly different in England and France um, than it is in Australia and, 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 and the Southern Hemisphere. Get, getting that mutual understanding, I think, is, is really important. Um, and and I, think, I think we can do it. Um, you know, ultimately, it means less rugby being played. You know, we, we can't... Um, the, the, Players need rest. Uh, there needs to be breaks. There needs to be pre-season. Um, and, and actually, if you look, there's so many, so many weeks in the year. We need to play less rugby, um, and and that needs to be shared between international and domestic. Everyone needs to play slightly less. Um, so if we can get that, then um, then, then then that will will be a win-win. But you but you're right. We do have this moment where the commercial realities are, are kind of you know, giving us the opportunity to, to, to really drive hard on this more than they ever have done through you know, the boardrooms and, and, and the corridors of World Rugby. Awesome, thank you. Hi there, uh, thank you very Hi, much. Hi Lucy. That was really interesting. Um, I just had a bit of a question uh, at a slightly more generic level about leadership. What advice or tips do you have for leading teams through this really challenging period through COVID, both kind of from a management perspective for you and then also, I imagine, for um, the players themselves, keeping people really kind of engaged and motivated in such an unprecedented time? Yeah, well, I think, I think the key to it is communication um, and, and keeping connected. I think, you know, the most especially for a team sport, it would be different, you know, obviously in a business, slightly, slightly different uh, approach, but you know, still valid, I think, um, is, is, keeping, is keeping you still uh, feeling that you're, that sense of you're part of a team. Um, so, so I know that they've kind of, you know, set up different WhatsApp groups, everyone's taking responsibility for communicating amongst the groups on a, on a regular basis. You also need to look at what you know what, what you as a as a leader communicate to the whole group um and and certainly up the frequency of that i uh, i think you know in the normal times when you kind of set a vision um and, you, and you, you've got an outcome you're kind of aiming for in, in in terms of a purpose as an organization or as a group of people you know you, there's much probably less frequent communication as you're kind of heading towards that goal right now it need, it, need, it probably needs to be quadrupled in terms of the amount of communication and and that's not necessarily saying you're going to communicate with anything new um, but because the rate of change is so quick um, the guidance is so quick the how we're responding to it you know everything that's happening around covid is is moving so quick you, we, you definitely have to communicate much much more frequently i think that's something to think about as a leader in any context when you get a major change where where it kind of accelerates from the normal change into something kind of critical like we've got at the moment communication 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 um and and it, i mean it's funny in rugby because you're all those players are used to being in a team environment um depends on where they are in lockdown at the moment because if they're with their families that's probably okay but there are a couple who are living on their own you go from a team environment where you've got regular dialogue with your teammates and your staff to being in a house on your own for six weeks as we have been that that is is quite a change and you know that there are definitely there are some some 
players who are struggling with that, you know, and 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 struggling with getting getting up and in the morning with purpose and getting out of bed and 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 getting getting to it. Um, so you've just got to be mindful of that as well. Um, I think it, you know that's just obviously specific to a team sport like like, like rugby. But I think generally it, it's all about communication um, and keeping people connected. Um, you know, everyone who's been you know furloughed, I suspect is you know what, 350 staff at the RFU furloughed out of the 500. You know they will all be feeling yeah different different you know, different levels of motivation different levels of kind of connectivity to to the organization and it's important to try and keep that connection there great thank you that's from myself just building on um lucy's question how did you find the transition from playing well leading on the pitch to leading in the boardroom and then my housemate here has got a question about um Who's who do you think's better placed to lead world's rugby response to COVID? Uh, Bill Beaumont or Augustine? <laughs> very, very good questions. Um, and, and how, how did I find how do I find the transition? I think any, anyone who anyone who says that the transition out of um, again a team based sport like, like rugby um, and, and where you're playing in front of um, <coughs> excuse me playing in front of big crowds on a regular basis, got the adrenaline buzz of, of, of the weekly match. Um, moving out of that into any other walk of life is very difficult. Um, it takes time. I always say to any player who's coming towards the end of their career, don't expect, you know, don't expect this to be a six month thing. It's going to be a two to three year thing. Um, and, and the first time I can remember standing in, in the stadium or sitting in the stadium watching what was you know all the players I'd played with previously all my mates you know playing but I wasn't on the pitch I I could hardly watch to be honest um, and and so so it, it takes a long time to to make that transition um, and, and I think then you are you know, we were lucky enough in the sense of you know we we had half our careers as amateurs and, and half as professionals so we had jobs before that, I think if you've only been a professional player like everyone is now, from you know leaving school or leaving uni or, you know, through to uh, say you're 30, 32, it's much harder to know what you want to do afterwards. You know, it, it's probably like some of you guys are feeling coming towards the end of your, your degrees. You know, you haven't got that clarity about what you want to do. But I would say to to everyone, it's you know you don't have to know what you want to do. Just step into something. Um, and once you're in it, you'll know whether it's right for you or not. But at least once you're in that, you can start to develop other skills and, and other experiences that are going to help you formulate where you really do want to go. If, if that's not the right place as that first step. Um, you know, I've moved across four, four different jobs um, in my career since leaving, since leaving rugby, but all with kind of transferable skills. I mean, if you told me eight years ago that I'd be in headhunting, I'd have said you yeah, have no chance. Um, so it is a, it is about just making that step across. So I, I'd say transition, I, I, I coped with it, but it was very hard. Uh, and, I, and I would never hide behind, you know, pretending otherwise. Um, and I would never say to anyone else who is making the move that it is going to be a, a, anything other than hard. On your second question, which is a, a very uh, political one, given that World Rugby Council has voted for um, Gus Pichot or, or, or Bill Beaumont, you know, this this weekend, and, and we'll find out who who wins that on May the twelfth. Um, I, I think it probably comes back to. I mean, they're being presented and portrayed in the press, um, and to some extent, I'm sure Gus is doing this um, himself as the kind of young, dynamic going to get changed through very quick um, as opposed to uh, which is Gus um, yeah more stable longer term um, which is Bill um, and, I, and I think each union has got to make its mind up about you know what kind of person they want at the helm in in this period of significant change um, and and challenge you know absolutely dramatic challenge for the sport um, 
and 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 they've you know like everything when you've got two people like that you know they've each got their strengths and weaknesses um i don't know them well enough to make a judgment call you only go on their kind of public persona um the world rugby council i hope do know them well enough as people um as as well as their kind of um manifestos which are actually quite similar their manifestos are quite similar um i suspect it's just about the pace of change and how quickly it will be forced through that's different um so you know i know it's a political answer in in, in case of who's going to be best um i mean if i was if i was voting for it um given where we are at the moment um i i, I would be thinking who's going to be the steadier hand on the tiller um right now given so much change um everywhere in the sport um but that's just a personal view so um phil obviously dealing with this crisis has um enabled you to work with a lot of different people and different um backgrounds and obviously they need certain strategic strategic skills or whatever to deal with these problems um to work through what's going on what would you consider to be a key graduate attribute um, and why? Mm, good question. A key graduate, graduate attribute, I, th I think, I think if you haven't, if you got, haven't got, if, if you haven't got the enthusiasm and the willingness to learn um, and 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 that kind of you know almost like that hunger for knowledge and experience. I, I I think coming out as a graduate because obviously you haven't got experience in the sense of working experience. I'm sure all of you have done placements or and or work experience, so you know you have got some of that, but you haven't got significant amounts of that. Because clearly, because you you know you've been at school and and been traveling in uni, whatever it is you've been doing, but. Um, so you can't be expected to have that. So I, I, I'd probably sum it up in attitude, actually, um, because that's something that, you know, you can all choose. Uh, I always say to everyone, you know, you, you can choose your attitude. No one else chooses your attitude for you. You do. You're in total control of that. You can get out of bed in the morning and be positive, um, looking for opportunity, um, looking to meet new people, looking to find out about other people, um, looking at where there might be kind of areas of connection where, you know, you can mutually help each other. You come out with an attitude which is win-win, which I, I always, you know, prefer. So any good negotiation, any good conversation has got to be about win-win. You're going to benefit, I'm going to benefit. How are we both going to benefit out of this rather than the win-lose scenario, which, which some people do. And that kind of, so I, I'd kind of sum it up with, with, with attitude, really, um, kind of underpinning that with a, a real honest assessment of, of, of your kind of strengths and, and, and weaknesses um, as a person. Um, and, and, and don't try and, you know, fluff it, just be honest about that. Yeah, so in, in, in summary, Chantal, I, I think it would be attitude. Really, really interesting, really insightful. Um, I was wondering, um, this, yeah, um, I was wondering, rugby is a bit weird because you have different types of rugby. Obviously, you have union, league, you know, also have touch rugby. Um, it, that's kind of why I'm asking this question because I started the touch rugby club at, um, at Durham. I'm kind of wondering what, how, how you see those different types of rugby and whether you value them, whether you think it could help rugby generally to, for those different codes to work together. So I know that, um, for example, rugby participation is apparently declining in, in many countries because of the, the head injuries, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I yeah, the, the, your point about the different types of, 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 of rugby, and yeah, the touch rugby is a fantastic way to get into the game. Um, it is also in its own right in New Zealand and Australia, one of the biggest sports there. They've got touch rugby leagues, which are mixed touch rugby league, fantastically social games, as well as at the top level, uh, extremely fast, um, and, and you have to be extremely fit to play it, and, and everything in between. So I've always been a fan of, uh, of, of touch rugby in its own right, as well as a way to get people into contact rugby. 
Um, so, so actually the RFU has, you know, done that pretty well o over the last six, seven years with, with programs like O2 Touch. Um, and, and it is now, I, I, I think, I think when I first, first kind of engaged them when I was at, I was at Sport England, it, it, it was very much a kind of, you know, we're just going to play men's 15 aside contact. And that culture has really shifted in the, in the last seven or eight years. Um, and, and actually new other different f forms of rugby, cross rugby, you might have heard of that, has also been tried. Um, and, and to be honest, it is in response to you know, the, the decline in participation at that time. And there's no doubt there's been a decline um, in, in, in men's 15 aside games being played. Um, and and touch rugby is, is is a very for me is a very valid part of it. I'm, gl I'm glad you kind of got into rugby through that. Um, it, there's a slightly different scenario with rugby league, given that rugby league effectively broke away from rugby union. Poor, oh, don't know how many years it was ago now, but you know, decades ago, um, and and was a professional sport at a time when rugby union was an amateur one. Um, so, so there's a lot of history of, of rugby league um, taking players from rugby union uh, and therefore they've been banned from playing rugby union in the amateur days. Now we're both professional. I think, you know, there's a lot more. We always used to watch rugby league before, before we played our games um, on a Saturday. You know, they were on a Friday night. Fantastic game. Um, so I think amongst the players, you, you know, particularly in Yorkshire, and the kind of heartlands of, of rugby league, people play both um, and, and they move between both. Um, so there's less animosity than there used to be, you know, pre-professionalism in 1995. So I, I, I think for me, you know, it's about getting people running with the ball and passing with the ball. Um, anything that does that is good as far as I'm concerned. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Phil, for tonight. Um, I was on a conversation with one of your friends early on today, and um, he said I should ask you a question as the last question. So, you better, it, depending on who that was, Chantal, you better not. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, I have to say thank you because you can just sign off straight away afterwards if you don't want to answer the question. How's that? <laughs> And my question to you is, um, why are you called the Growler? Ah, okay. Yes, I know who you've been talking to. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we, have a, um, we have a cycle group of us who um, uh, we, we go on a trip to, uh, which we won't be doing again this year, but I'm pretty sure we go on a cycle trip to France, about 40 or 50 of us. Um, and and I, am, I am responsible for... Um, uh, finding anyone who um, does any kind of misdemeanor on the trip. And that's why I'm called the Growler. <laughs> Not quite the answer. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much for tonight. And thank you so much for your support on the Leadership Academy. No problem. Well, can I just wish all the students, you know, good, good luck, um, you know, whichever kind of stage you're at. Um, you know, re re really important, I think, in this time that you all keep talking to each other as, as much as I know you are based on what my son's doing um, but really important to you know lean on each other in this time as, uh, as, as well as obviously the university so good luck thank you